Hey everybody, welcome back here to the Woodworking Wisdom Workshops. My name's Colin Way. We are going to start today with some workshop tools. We've had a slight change of plan um, only because I expected to get three tools made in a single hour today. Um, when I started practicing and making sure everything was going to go right for today, I quickly realized that we're never going to get all of those tools done in such a short period. So today's going to be part one, and then next Tuesday we're going to have part two. So part one's going to involve making a marking gauge. Um, if you've been watching since the very beginning, so last year, probably the same sort of time, I made a set of tools, the same as we're going to do today, um, and it went down really, really well. It was a really popular um, uh, popular couple of hours. A marking gauge, you've, you've seen, or if you've seen me prep for turning before, you'll understand that I use a marking gauge all of the time for, for truing up, really, for um, finding center. My marking gauge that I use is a regular um, shop bought one. This is a this is a Marples, so a Sheffield made one. Um, the one I made last year is this one here. All right, so very similar, a little bit bigger than the one we're going to make today. And the one I made just this morning, just to make sure everything, all the kit was working well, was this one. Now the good thing about this, and I'm going to show you the other tools that we're going to make in a minute. The good thing about this is we got some threading to do, so we've got a nice little thumb screw to make. So the internal, external part of that thread. Okay, so nice and easy there. Or well, nice and easy. We'll see how easy it is in a minute. But we're going to make a box or use a box threading tool for that one. Um, and there's also, is this is a marking gauge. We've got a little marking pin in here as well. And um, we're going to raid the nail box for, for our marking pin. So there's only three pieces of timber to use um on this and i'm going to get those pieces of timber out but next week just before i put these away we've got my little palm mallet here so used for carving um, nice little dinky palm mallet not necessarily used by the handle this is more in the palm and you tap gently so it's not a big clubbing hammer that sort of thing it's a nice dinky one and then a braddle and we've got a ferrule to make all those sorts of things there so that's next week let's have a look at this one so first of all we've got a question though craig is on the questions jason's on the um, the cameras today. So yes, Craig, what do we have? Yeah, good afternoon, everybody. Hope you're all well. Um, yeah, question from David Colwyn. Um, not necessarily relating to this one, but um, what is the name of the laminated wood you use on your sanding table, which fits to the lathe saddle? Yes. Um, well, the laminated. I've got two. I mean. I'll use a mixture of materials. So the one that I've got here at the moment, this one, this is actually um, it's uh, an MDF, but it's a, a worktop MDF. So you've got like a almost like a formica top to it. Um, this literally was cut off an old um, unit that we had here, but that's MDF. I also like using ply, and so birch face ply is something that's used fairly often, and you can see the laminations on that one. So um, Ply would work well on the sanding table as well as MDF. Basically, it's anything that's been engineered um, and won't warp like regular timber will. That's that's the reason that it's used. So birch face ply or good quality plywood um, or a decent density um, MDF. I know MDF means medium density, but if you can get you can get some very high density ones as well. Um, and this sort of worktop um, uh, MDF is pretty good. All right. How's that, Craig? All right for the minute. I think it's okay. The microphone, we might just have a little bit of rub. Maybe either rub it off and wipe it glasses. Right then. Keep me posted yeah, on there. that one. Yeah, keep me posted. Make sure you let Craig know if it's still happening. So that's what we're going to make. We're going to make a little marking gauge. So let's have a look. The timber we're using is only three pieces of timber. Um, so we've got the main section which is a piece of i've got a piece of beach i have prepped this up by the way and you can see on the camera there i've got a blind hole um it's blind hole as in it's down to just past center which is really quite important because we're going to drill the center bit out as well in a moment so there's that i've got the main handle this is a piece of oak um that's going to be a fairly simple bit of turning there is going to, again going to be a very small hole drilled in there of about two millimeters to to um cope with the the pin that will dictate you know really depend on you and what nails that you can get sort of thing and then this piece here this is going to be used for threading this is going to be the little thumb screw that we make afterwards 
Okay. Um, let's just have a very, very brief look before we start turning at the threading box I'm going to use. Um, and like any tap and die, you've got the bit that cuts the uh, male thread here, and then you've got the bit that cuts the, the female. Has a little leader tap um, on here, so you put that one in first. It's got a little taper on there, and then you've got the main section of cut here. So that will go um, on the inside. I'm, I'm not going to do it just yet. We're going to do it in a second. And then for cutting the thumb screw, so here's an example of that little thumb screw there. We've got this section here, and that just basically leads in. It has to be a specific size to cut, um, and we're going to do one for you so you'll see exactly um, how that works. So those are our, um, our bits of kit. There is links to those also beneath this video. So you'll see the links to those if you're interested in getting a threading kit. They're available in about five or six different sizes. This particular one is a half inch, by the way. Okay, so let's just pop that to one side for a minute. Let's do the, the important bit. Now, this is the, the bit of timber that I prepped, and I prepped it by... Um, marking with a marking gauge, it's a little bit of a chicken and egg situation, um, where the exact center is. So just by, let me grab my marking gauge and demonstrate that a second. So by roughly setting center and then scribing each face like that and where they intersect will be our center. And we do that on both sides. I've then with a, a, a square, just um, give myself a nice line up through and carry that through the top. Just pop on to number three camera there, Jace, would you? Lovely. So you can see that I've just carried that line up through, and then I've held that in my pillar drill. This wasn't secure enough to hold in any way on the lathe, so I held that flat on the pillar drill with the fence behind it and drilled down to the halfway point. Okay. Now all I'm going to do now is quickly use that tap, and the tap we're going to start with is the, the one with the taper. Okay, it comes with a little bar. You pop that through and do the screw. Pop that through. And I'm just going to literally hold this by hand. It's that easy. And immediately it start cutting. You want to keep it clear. So like you would a normal, if you have any engineers there, like you would a normal tap and die set, you want to keep the swarf clear. makes one of those really pleasing noises as it cuts. And it's just going to get to the top, the bottom of that blind hole, and I won't be able to go any further. A little bit of wax in there if you get too much screeching, but there we are. That's the bottom of the hole. So then we're going to swap over our taps. And just finish the hole off. It's already cut. I don't know whether whether we can see at all. You can see the thread there just. Okay, it's starting to cut a really nice thread for us. I need to make sure that now that thread is cut all the way to the bottom. And so we Finishing that thread, we'll just get another question from Craig. Okay, so we've got a, a couple of questions. Um, first one's for me, I'm afraid. Um, a question from Cliff. He's just treated himself to a new cast iron router table, and he's got an oil coating on the top. The answer is yes. Can we get any new machine with that kind of oil coating? Remove that kind of transit grease to stop it rusting when it's sat in a, in a warehouse or something. So we remove that. With Action remover, or even a light white spirit, give it a little bit down, and then yes, apply some sort of machine wax just to stop uh, any rust building up and make sure everything slides beautifully over the surfaces. surfaces. Um, yeah, question um, from Maria in Wales. She's got a few of these thread boxes, had to replace one of the blades because uh, it had a bad chip, nightmare to set the blades. Show us how to set the blade, oh, yeah, I will once I've done the threading in a moment. 
just in case I don't set it correctly. You're dead right. It does take a little bit of practice to set it. Let, I do have a blade here. Let me just show the camera. All right, so that's the blade. They are a simple V, um, and they need to be absolute razor sharp. In terms of the angle at the back, I don't know that for sure, but I wouldn't change it from what it comes with because I found that that works the best. I've tried to change the angle, and it 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 needs a bevel rubbing basically um unfortunately maria with the way i set it is trial and error i'll increase it a little bit give it a go increase it a little bit give it a go take it back give it a go until i've got it right there is no tried and tested trick that i know of that will get you right first time it is one of those things unfortunately um and in terms of um, taking that off, you've got the, the, I don't know whether you can see this from above there. So this is your lead in side. So this is the, um, almost like the register that you, you run your um, dowel through and then it hits the cutter down there. The cutters actually, you can just see the shavings or the port for the shavings to come out here. And then this little bolt at the top is your lock point. All right. So you increase or decrease the pressure um, on there and that, will allow you then to either pull back or um, or push forward on the actual um, cutter. You have to do that by accessing from this block as well. So it's trial and error, I'm afraid, uh, Maria. I don't have a solution um, to get it just right. you just got to keep playing. Okay, so let's go for some turning. Let's get a small tool rest in there. We'll pick up a few more questions in a second. Let's get a little bit of turning done first. So I've got center point. I've got my hole drilled and now tapped as well. So that's all good. I'm going to roughly turn this to a cylinder, then hold it in a set of jaws so I can drill the center out ready for the main um, right, main arm. Okay. So lay speed is zero because it's a new bit of turning up with the speed. Let me just bring my dust extraction in. I am going to use some dust extraction in a minute, so I'm going to do that. Any comments on, on the sound all good for me? Small bowl gouge, quite quick. I'm going to be up to about 2,000 revs. Quarter inch bowl gouge, six mil bowl gouge, and I'm just going to roughing cut. So dropping the handle right down low. There we are. Chase, just go on the camera three a minute. There we are. So you can see all I'm doing is skimming across that section. One thing to be a little bit careful of, don't be, don't be um, fooled, because it's going to feel like this is still square, when actually it's perfectly round, you're just skipping over the hole that you've already drilled. So just be a little bit aware of that. I want to. I don't want to go too big with this head, so I'm going to take a little bit more off than than I need, and I'm going to use my nice large set of what we call H jaws to hold this. Just to start with, this is a jaw that has quite a big gripping area on the inside. Okay, so I'm just going to quickly measure those. I'm not going for perfect round. Um, if I went for perfect round, it'd actually be too small a grip. So I want to maximize uh, the size. Let me just see. Well, would you know, we're about there. We're about there. So that's good. Now, I'm not doing anything but roughing down. I'm not sanding or doing anything like that. Because what we're going to do now just hollow it out or make a hole through the center. Let me just clean up this bearing surface. So that's my first bearing surface. So I've got a good clean side, a good clean edge here as well. So we can add our chuck. Yes, Craig. Hi, so hopefully you can hear me a little bit better, guys. Sorry, just switched microphones. Um, Cliff, apologies, you didn't quite hear the answer to my 
uh, to, to your question. Um, really, the rags of table, yeah, clean off all that transit oil and stuff. Get it back down to bare cast iron, get it clean, and then, yeah, give it a good uh, machine wax up. Um, and that should uh, should serve you well with, with all new machines, cast iron tables. That's the way to go. Um, guys, let me know if the mic is okay. Thank you very much. There we are. So I'm gripping that in there. This is a small piece. I'm not too worried. Just bear this in mind. So if you're holding a large piece of turning, if you're making a big bowl, if you're doing a hollow form, you want to get the jaws where they're at their most, uh, where they're at their perfect circle. We call it the optimum size. The optimum size is, is about six mil, quarter of an inch between jaws. I'm not using optimum size. I'm, I'm holding a small piece um, and I'm not putting much pressure on it. I'm happy with that. So we're okay. Um, guys, if you do hear a little bit of rumbling and tool, tool noises and, and bumps and crashes, we're having a little bit of work done upstairs in the canteen. So please excuse us. I'm sure it'll only be for this session. We'll be back to normal again soon. Um, so yes, th that was my advice on it. Like I said, I'm only using a small portion of that jaw, only a very sort of gentle touch. So, you know, don't take what I'm here, what I'm saying here for when you start making your big bowls and stuff, you need maximum grip on those bowls. Lay speed to zero again, turn the machine on. Okay. There's a bit of wobble because I've got a true surface now. So this is an error on this surface. We need to take that out. So I'll do that first of all, with a pull cut from the back bowl gouge. Just skim that surface. There we are. And then we are going to, I'm going to scrape. I'm going to give it a scrape. A nice little negative rate scrape with a side of our skew. Because it's side grain, I can get away with that. There we are. That's fine. We'll sand that in a minute. I will forget, I'm sure. But I'm going to sand. Before we get that far, let's take out what I need to take out with a drill bit first for the handle to slide through. Remember what we're making at this stage. I need to make one of these. Okay, that's what we are making here. So I need the hole through the middle now. So what size drill is this? And to be honest, it's, you know, it doesn't really matter. This is 20 mil, so three quarters of an inch would be fine as well if you're an imperial. Um, 20 mil. And a forced a bit's better. Um, if not a forced a bit, a sawtooth bit. I've got a sawtooth bit there because it's only... I couldn't find a forced a bit the right size, so the sawtooth is actually... I'll do for the minute, as it's a shallow drill chuck. And we're only going to go through two-thirds of the way. I don't want to go all the way through because there's potential that I'll hit the chuck if I do that. So two-thirds of the way. Um, lay speed wants to be nowhere near the 2,000 that I just had. About 900 is fine. One hand on the chuck. Make sure you've aligned your centers up. Again, another really important bit here. There we are. Up to or just past halfway. So about two-thirds in, like I say. And then back out. Before I take that out, I'm just going to sand this surface so we can complete that, that surface. So dust extraction on. I'm not going to go crazy with sanding as well. I don't, I'm not going to bother going up to like 400 grit. So let's go. I've got 100 here. And then we go 150, 240. Only this surface. I don't need to do the edge yet because there's jaws in the way. That's that one. So now we'll swap over. And we'll do the same thing. Just repeat what I've just done. Yes, Greg. I've got a question from Maria. Um, on other demos, you've mentioned lip and spur drill bits. Are they the same as brad point bits? Uh, yes, they are, Maria. Yeah, Brad Point is the same. Lip and Spur. I'll show you one in a minute. We're going to do a little bit of drilling with one in a sec. Okay, so there we are. We're going to come in from this side. And so we hit that hole. There we are. We're through. And 
Make sure we take out that drill bit before I get my elbow on it. Quickly sand up and then we'll have a look at one of those drill bits. So 100, 150. Four hundred. There we are. All right, we'll turn off the extraction. Another question there from Craig. Yeah, question from Woodwork Learner. Um, what's the maximum grit you would go to on a bowl? Four hundred or more? Well, it really depends on the timber. Um, exotics especially will want you to go even higher at eight hundred a thousand because the density of the timber you will see fine scratches i would definitely recommend that at that point that you mix up your sanding as well so do um, 50 percent with a rotary sander 50 percent with hand sanding that way you get crisscrossing grain patterns and they sort of um they cross each other out but no some of the real dense exotics you'll probably have to go like I say to some wet and dry and even sand with um water or uh, wax as well so no i'm um, uh, things like ash and beach and all that sort of stuff you get away with 400 but those dense timbers go higher that's great and john's asking what wood are you recommending for this project so this is beach um but i've got a mixture i've got beach and ash that we'll later on um, look out for the little mallet so beach head um ash handle um i've got some uh what have i got for the oh we got some coca bolo for the braddle because that's more decorative it's not so structural um so you can get away with pretty much anything for that um but here i'm using oak for the handle um, of a marking gauge beach for the uh, main head and then also oak for the little thread as well when it comes to creating threads you do need something that's a little bit dense so those softer materials um, aren't really any good if you've got a lovely bit of spotted beach for instance not great for this project um, lime's not great for this project you know those softer materials that um that, that, that might be nice to turn not necessarily good to cut threads in Okay, so what we have now so far, we have two clean faces, we have a hole through the center for the main arm, and then we have our threaded hole here. But I've just held the outside of this in quite um, um, an aggressive chuck, or sorry, aggressive jaw. There, There's a grip of jaw. So I now need to clean the surface up and go to the size I want to. So we're going to hold between the two centers, okay? And we're going to hold using friction. So I've got a, a ring center in the headstock, and you have to bear in mind now what you're going to put in your tailstock. If I go with a regular pointed center or even a little ring center, so either of those two, they will clash. They will clash with my ring center. So I'm going to go even shorter. I ha happen to have a hollow live center here. And I'm going to make that work in conjunction with my ring center. It's a little bit dumpier on here. If you don't have one of these, put a normal um, tailstock center in and use a, a wooden drive. Let me just show you what my wooden drives look like. So I hold that in the chuck. Okay, and just do a taper. If that was smaller, for instance, that would drive this piece. We're going to use that on next week's um, uh, video to look at how we drive the um, head of the mallet. So that's what that's for. Yes, Craig, another question? Yeah, question from Terry. Um, when polishing wood, is there a special mop, stitched and loose? Um, he's seen some are different. Yeah, so um, it, if you're going to use polishing compounds, so like Triple E, Tripo Max, Buff, um, Plastimax, all those sorts of things, go with a stitched mop. My preference is to go with um, grade G. It's a little bit softer than the Bs. Um, so grade G just gives... For, for those materials on timber, I find it works better. And then you go with loose leaf mops if you're using waxes, so carnaubers and things like that. I certainly recommend using carnauba over the top of things like Tripoli and, and Buff. Okay. Yes, great. Yeah, another couple of questions. A question from Debbie. She's recently got an AH1218 VS, VS lathe, so one of our hobby um, level benchtop lathes. Um, what does she need for the live end to drill holes? Sorry, complete newbie, she says. Yeah, no, no, absolutely no problem at all. You've got two choices. 
If you go for something like this, so this is a keyless um, chuck. This is the ones I tend to use all the time purely because it means I don't lose key um, keys in shavings, that sort of thing. Um, so I'll use one of these on a Morse taper number two for my lathe, which will be what you need. Generally, these are it's a B16 taper this end. Now, I don't want to confuse you at all. So what I'll do, let if you could email the question, I'll send you back the link unless our guys can find the link for you now. The other option would be a keyed version of the same chuck with the same taper here. Now, I know the keyed version is available as the set of Arbor and Chuck. I'm not so sure whether the keyless one is. They're going to find for you and they're going to try and post that up um, now. Um, failing that, send me that question as an email and we'll get it answered for you. But yeah, so it's just drill Chuck basically on a B16 to an M2 or MT2. Yes. And a question from Woodwork Learner. Um, you've seen people strengthen the threads with CA glue. Does this make any difference in the long run? Um, I suppose if it's um, if it's a soft timber and you got away with actually cutting it, then yeah. Or unless you're suggesting that you glue it first, let that set, then cut into it. Now, that's not such a bad idea. I would, in theory, think that that works perfectly well. Um, never tried it myself. Um, but no, that sounds like a good idea. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I'm just cleaning the end up now. So it's a fairly simple task. Um, I'm going to go fairly gentle with a, a six mil gouge at about 2,000 revs. So a quarter inch bowl gouge, skim that surface. You can choose to keep it square or you can very slightly radius the top of that surface. It's entirely up to you. All right, let me just check to make sure those jaw marks have disappeared. And it looks like we're good. So that's fine. So we can sand that now. So I'm going to put dust extraction on for this because there's quite a lot of sanding to do. Um, and we're going to start with 100 grit again. You're obviously going to take the time necessary to make this look really lovely. I'm going to rush this on a little bit. Don't let this get hot because what will happen here, we've got two massive areas of end grain. Those bits of end grain will split if you get them really hot. So keep taking that paper away. Let everything cool down. Let your fingers do the, let your fingers be the, the temperature gauge. Let's have a check to see if we've got much, a little bit of tearing on the end grain there. Generally it'll be on both sides. So just a wee bit more. That'll do us now 150. And then we'll finish up on this project with 240. Yes, great. So we've got a couple of questions. Um, the first one, to avoid heating the sandpaper during sanding, what's the best recommended speed? Um, does the speed depend on the kind of material being, being used? The speed yeah, definitely depends on the material. Um, it also depends on the size, the physical diameter of the piece as well. Um, because the, the bigger the diameter, the more surface speed you're going to get. That was there running at 1850. So it's quite quick. But what you may have noticed that I would kept releasing the paper from the piece. If you just keep the paper on the on the timber, it will heat up very quickly. So keep removing the paper, turning it over to a cooler area and then have another go. So nothing's getting too hot, for, certainly for too long either. Um, if at all unsure, turn the lay speed down. If you're not in any rush, which you shouldn't be. Um, then we're certainly on bigger pieces like bowls, keep the lay speed low for, for certainly for sanding and use a power sander where possible because power sander means that you're, you know, again, it won't heat up too quickly. As long as you're sanding with, um, with abrasive that isn't dead. 
Because once your abrasive completely dies, you'll be pushing forever and ever, harder and harder, trying to make it work, and it won't. And it'll just keep heating up and heating up and heating up. So, yeah, just make sure your paper's all right. Okay, so there we are. Look, we've got our first piece. Um, it looks a fairly complicated piece, but you saw then it wasn't. Um, I made that done that hole um, before we started. Let me get some of that rubbish out of there. I done that hole before we started um, and threaded it in. So the thread's already there. There we are. It's all the way through, thankfully. Yeah, all the way through. So we're ready now to go on to the next piece. That's going to be the main arm that goes all the way through. Um, and again, we need to size that. So I've got a piece of oak here that we're going to use. Uh, where is it? There it is. One bit I've got centered up already. So it's just a piece of oak. I say it's just a piece of oak. It's a lovely piece of oak. It's just cut per perfectly through those medullary rays there. You can see the fleck. Should be on the other side as well. Look. So we're just going to turn that to a straight cylinder. Nothing complicated with it. It has to be a straight cylinder. Otherwise, it won't slide up and through the shoulder. Let me get rid of that center. We need a regular center in there. I'll keep the the ring center in that one will be perfect and let's go for a ring center the other side so there we are my ring center so nothing complicated like i say on this piece i have roughly sized this bit of timber all i have to do to it really is take it down to around and then i'll start checking size and um, we want it to slide through slide through our shoulder nicely without sticking but we don't want it to be sloppy either nice and quick i want to be up 2000 that's actually 2300 roughing gouge In terms of rough and gouge, uh, I do see a lot of people doing this overhand grip. The only issue with that, and that's fine, but already you can see my knuckles turning white, and they lose sensation when they do that. I tend to prefer having my hand underneath and this finger running along the tool rest. The tool, ren there, tool rest then acts as your guide. Now, you would think we'll skew that. The trouble is, a small piece like this and using a skew could cause you problems because, look, I've got the grain coming up at this angle, this side. On the other side, it's coming up the other angle. So it could cause us problems. So I'm going to just stick to that for the minute and just test it in our, our top and see. All right, I'm too, at the moment, we're way too big. So we've got another skim to take off of that. And we're going to keep going until we we travel through them nicely. Do another check. You can't check enough times, if I'm honest. Um, it's rather that you check and check and check than not check often enough and end up you know sliding through too easily now that's actually almost a size i'm just going to do one final skim and then we're going to sand yes great a question from frederick what are the advantages on using a larger, larger roughing gouge over a narrower one the contact area with wood must be about the same. Yeah, yeah, you're, pretty, you're right. I mean, the, th the difference is it's like a bowl gouge using a big bowl gouge over a small one. When you want to, you can get a bigger cut, literally or simply by pushing harder. You'll actually progress that chisel further into the timber. So if you're doing a four or five inch newel, you'll need an inch and a quarter uh, roughing gouge and a half inch roughing gouge just would, simply wouldn't be big enough you'll be there all day because it can't physically take big enough cuts however the other way round you can do a piece of jewelry or a lace bobbin 
with an inch and a quarter roughing gouge because you can be delicate with it. So you can back off the cut a little bit. So that's the reason, really. Bigger projects need a bigger tool to create a bigger cut. Otherwise, you'll just be there for longer. There we are. I'm not going to do any more there. I think if I just sand that, we'll be down to the right size. So 100 again, 100, 100 grit. We'll give it a test just to make sure. You know, I think I don't think I was right. I think we're going to need to do at least another cut. There seems to be a lot more to sand off than I'm willing to do. Let's just take another skim. Just a little bit at that end. There, that's it. Now we can sand. One fifty. And then on to our two forty. We're gonna go back over with two forty in a moment. Just need to clean up the ends. Right, before I do that, let me just double check one more time. Perfect. couple of little jobs now true up either end and we need to create a little hole we got a little pin a marking pin that's going to go through so let's clean up our ends and that we may as well go straight for a passing tool here i'm gonna take the waste away first with the passing tool and then we know what's coming after that so passing tool I'm sure it doesn't need any introduction, but I'll bring out the skew. Very slight radius. And you might wonder why I'm using the skew. If you think about how a parting tool works, it doesn't actually cut the timber. It's sort of raking that end grain out. Now, parting tool will leave a wonderful finish, which is what I need, which is what I want there. So there we are. Just running over that with a bit too forcey. We're going to take off these last little nibs in a second with a sander. There we are. Yes, Greg. So we've got a couple of questions. Uh, the first one is, how hard do you push the tools against the timber? Um, you're, you're not pushing that hard, actually. I've always said if you if you experience that white knuckle moment, then it's you're pushing too hard. But at the, when you're a beginner, when you're just starting out, that's very difficult to avoid. You know, you're gonna you're gonna have to have some degree of of, of grip there, um, which will start to relax as you get more confident. I'm sure most people, when they've started out, have experienced that aching hand. Um, experience or knuckles cramping up that's because there's too much pressure once 
you get all the angles right, you get the presentation just so the bevel's rubbing, the tools are sharp, then it's a very light touch. Um, you don't have to push hard at all until you start doing big pieces. Then you will f you you'll physically have to hold on to the tools um, harder than you would a smaller piece because you get more force off the timber. You think about all that force coming down on the chisel. So normal turning, not very hard at all. But like I say, the bigger pieces then... Yeah, you need to up your, your pressure a bit. Yes, Greg. So quite an interesting one from a question from uh, Frederick. Um, maybe we can both answer. He said he asks, uh, do you all do other jobs within Axminster or does planning these videos take up all of your time? <laughs> do you want to go first? Shall I go first? Go first. All right. Well, we do. We do these videos, as you, as you know. But we also do an awful lot of uh, staff training. We've got a, a good number of staff in Axminster and our retail and our customer services and our business team and stuff like that so we make sure that they all get as hands-on as they can we produce uh, video uh, training videos for staff when we can we get them in the workshops with us shoulder to shoulder learning uh you know how to use the tools um yeah and what, what else Colin? Well, as well as that of course there is um the product uh that we have to get across to you so when it comes to instructional uh, videos on different products whether that be a type of tool a type of machine um, or a process so that's all done product videos as well uh, sorry product photos as well that has to be done so when you see things in the in the catalog or on the website um that show a pair of hands generally it's our hands that are, that are in there and setting things up you know uh, as well as that we're um at normal times we're out doing um shows and and uh, and outside of work here we all have um our freelance stuff where we we do the same sort of thing advise um, give talks, demonstrations on woodworking and wood turning as well. So we're we're busy pretty much seven yeah, days a week woodworking. There's the work with product development as well because we manufacture here in Axminster chucks and jaws and UJK stuff and all sorts. We 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 come up with ideas for product which is cool, and we see those through to the end and we manufacture and test products that they have sent to them by suppliers and stuff. So. Yeah. One one of those products, you know, that we you've witnessed um, has been the dovetail jig that Craig's um, has adopted and um, and seen through to um, the the shop shelves now. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a good example. There's many things like that that we um, that we work on. The Cohenway signature skew is one of them oh, as I was well. <laughs> Look, all I'm doing here is just a, a very small 1.5 millimeter drill. I'm doing my very very best to be upright and central, of course. If you're at home and you have a pillar drill, then you make yourself a little V-block, you do it on the pillar drill. I don't want to walk away from camera to do that. That's the reason that I'm using a hand drill this time. Um, so that now we're just going to give that little area a rub down, just so there's no breakout on the back. And then whilst that's on there, might as well use, use the lathe. So what I've got is a, you, you use whatever nail you have, whatever size you want. All I've done is de-headed um, an old masonry nail. Okay. Sharpen the tip. So we've got an actual scribing cutting tip there instead. Okay. And that's all that's needed. This isn't, um, this is a marking gauge. It's not a cutting gauge. And then we're going to tap through. And you only want a small amount exposed. Um, with the world's smallest hammer. There we are. So you can see how much is coming through. I'll hold that up to the camera. Actually, it's a little bit far away for you to see. Uh, there we are. So you can see how much is coming through. You want this shorter. Okay, and it doesn't matter as long as this isn't flopping around and falling out, as long as you can move it, and it's generally a tap from a hammer because they will need to be sharpened from time to time. They are designed to be uh, moved backwards and forwards um, when you need to sharpen them. Okay, so it's just as long as that's coming out, it's nice and sharp and ready to go. Lastly, on this piece, I just want to make sure that these ends are taken off. We'll sand those away. No point doing or making um, life hard for ourselves. So Let's just, as we were talking about the sander earlier, right at the beginning, let's just add that. As 
So to add that, I need to use our C jaws. Not forgetting your lay speed at the moment, or my lay speed at the moment is very quick. So what I'm going to do, not forgetting that at all, wind my lay speed down, turn the machine on, and then increase your speed. It's just a, it's a thing that I developed as, as a habit as much as anything else. Just, first of all, reaching for the speed controller to turn it down before I hit the green button to start the machine. Yes, Greg? You just got a question on which lathe you're using there? Um, this is the 406, the 8406. Um, this is the one I own at home. It's the one I teach on, and we have a bank of them in here. For me, it's the best machine that I've had, I think, ever. I can honestly say that um, of its size. It does everything I want it to. It can do some seriously big stuff, um, but also it's not too clunky where it won't do my everyday bits and pieces as well. So it's a, a fantastic all-rounder for me. It's the 8406. Would the guys, um, they were the Axminster guys, just uh, pop that one up as a, as a link for us, just so people can see that, please. Um, okay, so Sandy, so let, we're going to have the dust extraction on, obviously. Um, just going to gently denib our ends. And we've got one small piece to do after this. We've got the actual thread itself. Once I've done the roughing down, so this is a quite a coarse grit here, it's about 100 grit. I'll go over to, I'll take that piece off, go over to the rotary head. <coughs> and that's one side. Rotary head with a, a softer pad and a finer grade. Just to clean that up. I mean, that's the, the versatility of that set of jaws there, going from that big sanding disc to tiny little controllable disc like that. It makes, you know, it speeds the day up so much. Okay, so let's knock the extractor off. So at the moment, we have those two pieces nicely fitting together. We need to be able to lock this in position now, though. Okay, we've got the actual marking um, pinned through. We need to be able to lock in position so we can stop and mark at any point. So we're going to create the, the male thread to go inside our cut thread there. So now this is where we're going to use the box. I'm going to turn down a piece of oak again. Um, and I'm going to hold that piece. I could hold it in there if I wanted to. It will just, because I've done it before, just close up small enough. In fact, because we can, let's do it. I was just about to say, but I'll go over to my other set of jaws. The jaws I was going to select would be those. Okay, because they go down to virtually nothing. But the C jaws are going to do the job, so let's not change for the sake of it. I've already put a little center point in here, so I know where center is. And I'm using the ring center and the tail stock. So just bring that up. This is only loose. I haven't tightened that right up yet. So once that's in centre, then I can tighten the chuck up. Small tool rest. Okay. Oh, one thing, Maria, I didn't show you that brad point. This is the drill bit that I drilled the um, the hole out in the head. So this is what we've got to match our size to. Okay. So the brad point, you can see that little centre point. And you've got two wings on the outside. So, yeah, lip and spur or brad point. 
Okay, so that's what we're going to size. I've already sized one, so I'm going to get my set of calipers and measure off of that. So external calipers. There we are, just sizing that bit. And then we can start turning. Oh, we'll start with the roughing gouge first. Almost too close. So roughing gouge first. So this is that question earlier, you know, about size of roughing gouge. That's a small piece. This is a big old gouge. We're going to run around about two, 2,300. But you get the idea. Quick. Small piece, so I want good surface speed. A little bit too high. There we are. So I've roughed down. I've taken the corners off. We've got a cylinder. So now we're going to start sizing. And for that, I'm going to use the beading and parting tool. Square section chisel. Well, you've seen me use these many times for rolling beads, that sort of thing. Um, but this is a six mil quarter inch version. Using the calipers. That first one was a little bit too small, so I'm going to ignore that one. Back with rough and gouge, take off the waste. That's great. Uh, Frederick's asked, what's the gold coating on the Brad Point bit, please? It always wanted to know. Um, so it's titanium nitrate. Um, it used to be used on things like turning tools as well. You'll see it on some um, Forstner bits, uh, sawtooth bits, Brad Point bits. It's a, a harder coating, so it's designed to make the edge last longer. I think that's all it does, isn't it? Makes it look pretty. Yep. Yep, looks pretty as well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there we are. So, of course, we're going to skew that surface. Yes, Greg. So, Maria say some people have said that soaking the threads in a bit of oil beforehand is beneficial. Is it? It doesn't make much difference on the small ones, but certainly as you get bigger, yes, it makes a massive difference um and when they say soaking it's 24 hours it's overnight so it's you know it's a long time um so yeah don't just cover it soak it all right on those not so not so bad on dense timbers but on the softer ones yeah that really helps there we are let's just have a check i'm going to take that right the way down and out of my way that will come off before we finish this project I think that should be all right. Let me just um, double check that with my test piece. Yeah, we're pretty good. I'm just going to do a very light sanding before we start. This with a this with the um, the 100. Just got the top there. There we are. Right, then we can start. Yes, Craig? Uh, Maria says, thanks for the answer. What oil for soaking? Well, anything. Uh, finishing oil, I guess, would be the best one. But to be honest, anything would work. Um, food safe oil, uh, lemon oil. I'm just looking up here. Yeah, food safe oil, lemon oil, um, Danish oil, any of those, really. Um, something you don't want it, what you don't want is using like a food, food oil, so, you know, something that's sour. Use one of your normal finishing oils. All right. Just take that out of the way. Right, I'm going to just move the tools. Don't be tempted. And the reason I say this is because I've been tempted before and then I've 
I've took myself to one side and had a word. Don't be tempted to do this threading with a lathe on slow. You'll have an accident. Something will go wrong. Um, this is to be done without the lathe running. Okay. The thought had crossed my mind a couple of times. And like I said, I've taken myself to one side and said, don't be silly. So just bring your tailstock out the way. Your box for threading. You have the lead section. So the, the blank section goes over. Okay. And when you start off, you have to, you have, to have a little bit of pressure. So I'm going to push forward and rotate. Let me get my tool rest out of the way. Push forward and rotate. Once you've got it biting, then you're away. Then you can just start winding. Let's just come out and show you, just to see what we've got so far. Okay. Um, I will. There we are. We've got a decent thread so far. I'm going to keep going. Wind it on. I don't need to go that far. I've gone a long way, but just give myself a little bit of extra just in case. Is that going to be enough? I think that'll be ample. Let me just put it against our piece. So that's going to be way plenty. So now, I haven't done anything to it yet. Look, I mean, there's a, a broken section right at the beginning um, there. So I'm just going to turn that off. Because I've got enough thread, that's fine. So let's just clean that up. So I'll use a parting tool. And we're going to part it off about there. I want to have a, a decent amount for, for to, you know, to add flats to, um, because we're going to need to be able to screw this up and so on. And let's do a nice chamfer at the beginning of the thread. Just rather than sand that away in its entirety, it's quite a large lump there. I just put a saw cut in. That's that one. And then the same at this end. Okay, now we can get the sander in. I'm going to show you that thread a second as I well. get a bit closer to the camera. All right, so we've got a nice little thread there. Haven't tested it yet. Hopefully it fits. We're going to go back with our sanding disc. So I just want to tidy up those ends. And then we can assemble the whole thing together. I'm going to add a little flat to this thumb screw as well. Just so we can get our thumbs around it. Play speed to zero, turn the lathe on. Yes, Greg. So, a question from Maria. Um, sorry for more box thread, the thread box questions, but with the larger one, it's difficult to start the cutting on the internal thread on a level, uh, i.e., ninety degrees. It moves around too much. Any tips? Um, I would say probably that. So, the start of that would be, um, I'm guessing, 
where you join into this um, this square section. Maybe, uh, I mean, I don't know, maybe it's that you're a little bit too small for that the, the thread box. So if you can get as close to that diameter as possible, um, then figure out the you know the exact position for the cutter it might be that um apart from that in a vice you know we were all taught this in school using a, a, a die up in a vice leveling it up by eye to start with and very gently starting that first cut i think that would be the 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 only advice i could give on that really getting as close to you can as the diameter of that uh you know that that, that lead in hole uh, i think she means the other the outer thread oh the same thing same thing. Um, this should find its own way. To be fair, um, it should find its own way into that hole. Again, it, it might be that you know, the hole size is a bit oversized. I don't know. Um, I know what you mean. The, the bigger you go, the more welly you need as well to drive these things into the larger hose. Like once you start going to those inch and a quarter, inch and a half, it can be quite a lot of pressure needed. Um, but maybe that, because again, you've got a lead in to that first um, part of the cutter there. So I can only suggest maybe a smaller hole in that case. Jim's asked what grit you have on your big disc. Uh, this is a 100 grit, this one, 100. Um, and you, the trouble is you go too fine on the disc sanders they'll clog up quite quickly and then you get those scorch marks quite quite rapidly as well so i tend to use that for the bulk of the sanding and then i'll go to the um the rotary discs with the soft pad on for the smaller pieces all right yes and a question from Lawrence. Um, is it a good idea to put some CA glue on the thread? Yeah, well, we've had that one, Lawrence. Yes, so I, it was a new one on me, but it sounds like a great idea, especially if the timber's soft um, before you cut um, or if it was soft and it's starting to crumble after you've cut. Yes, and then maybe then re-ream it again, of course. Um, yes. Yeah. And what TPI is the thread? I don't know. It's what, I'm, it's what I've given. I don't honestly. I don't know what the thread is in terms of TPI because we're cutting the male and female. It's not something I've ever needed to worry about. Um, they match each other. Um, uh, that's not very helpful if you're a restorer and you're trying to find a thread size for a particular size. Um, it doesn't say on the information um, whether it is a specific size or not. I'm not sure. That's the box, by the way. If anybody was looking. Um, yeah, so, no, I'm very unhelpful, unfortunately, there. And then we're going to throw in now a little top tip. Getting a little bit tight toward the end. So what I'm doing is just put a little bit of wax in. The wax will stop the screeching and really help it progress. Let me just... And that's that's working nicely. Just seizing up toward the end, but we're, luckily it's through, so we're okay. Let's pop the thing together. You can, on the other one, I put little flats on. There we are. You can, if you wish, let me grab the other handle. I don't know whether you can see that in that camera, but there's a little flat. I've just sanded that here. Yeah, that's a great view there, Jace. Thank you. So a little flat for that thumb screw then to bite onto to stop any rotation. If you're using them... Um, for a lot of carpentry, you might want to do that. If it's just for centering up your pieces, um, for turning, then it's not needed. And literally, then it's just a wipe around the corner. And you should have your center mark. All right. So there we are. There's our finished, finished project. Don't forget... This is going to be joined next week by our mallet, little palm mallet and and our braddle. So there's as many techniques, um, not as many gadgets and gizmos, but as many techniques in there to, to give you your, 
um, to finish those tools off as well. Those three tools there are really my right hand. You, you've seen me use this one all the time. A mallet's constantly used, and, and my braddle, the braddle lives in my back pocket. In fact, you know, the braddle's there all the time. So those really, for wood turn, there's essential pieces of kit. We've got another, another question we're going to answer before we finish. Yeah, I've got a couple of questions here, my friend. Um, from Jim, are there any issues with the wax causing the threads to swell? No. No, have not found any issues at all with that. It's really quite good, actually. Um, the, the, there's, they, I found the opposite almost. They create a very sticky joint to, um, to run really, really smoothly. If you're going to use a kiln dry piece of timber and then oil it heavily afterwards, then I can see potential for that happening. Um, but if you oil it before and cut your thread, no because you're cutting to size. What does happen sometimes, though, especially if you don't treat them with anything, is they'll plim up in the winter. Sorry, in the UK, they'll plim up in the winter because we have very wet uh, winters. Um, and then they'll dry out in the summer, like door frames, doors, you know, doors too. You get sticky in the winter and so on. Um, so that, that would be the only issue. So I would sort of, certainly advocate um, oiling them um, before finishing, yes. Great. Yeah, David's asked, can machine wax be used to lubricate the wood screws when uh, screwing into wood, or should it be wood wax? Uh, no, machine wax would be absolutely fine. No problem at all. Yeah, that would be a great lubricant. Yeah. Yeah, all good. Well, then, guys, that's the end of another one. Don't forget, if you like what we do, hit the thumbs up, subscribe to our channel, and share with as many people as you know um, or don't know. Um, and join me again next week. But don't forget, tomorrow... Um, we've got the next part of the Adirondack Chairs with uh, Craig and Jason. So until next time from me, it's goodbye. So thank you very much for watching. Bye-bye.